Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Julie Hyman. That is Josh Lifton. We're here at the New York Stock Exchange bringing you the top three stories you need to be watching at 3 p.m. We start with Rite Aid filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Trading currently halted in the shares. The stock is down over 80 percent over the past year and the pharmacy chain weighed down by declining sales and opioid lawsuits. The company has raised nearly three and a half billion dollars in new financing to keep operating through the bankruptcy process and it's retained a new CEO who will serve as the company's chief restructuring officer. We're going to talk about the fallout with a specialist in restructuring. And it is a big earnings week ahead. We're going to see reports from banks, airlines, and big tech. Netflix is expected to see revenue rise 7.7% to $8.54 billion in adjusted earnings of $3.57 per share. We're going to break down the three key things investors need to watch for, for including the company's plans for its struggling ad tier. We'll also get a read on Tesla following a quarter of price cuts and slower sales in China. And layoffs at LinkedIn, the professional networking company, which is owned by Microsoft, announcing the reduction of 668 positions across its engineering product, talent, and finance teams. This is the second round of layoffs for the company this year. Well, let's get you up to speed on the market action here. We do have stocks in the green here on this Monday. Uh, the Dow uh, up about 326 points. That's almost 1%. The S&P up 1.1%. And the Nasdaq up about one and a quarter percent today. Uh, it feels like there's a little bit of a waiting game uh, going on today in terms of waiting for earnings coming out, waiting for more data coming out. Uh, there's been a lot of Fed speak, so they don't really have to wait for that. But it's really been reinforcing the idea that there is likely not going to be another rate increase. So let's see how the Treasury market is behaving. In the meantime, amidst that, uh, we are seeing yields climb a bit today, um, or more than a bit, really, up by eight basis points for the 10-year to 4.71%. So let's dig a little bit more into what's moving the markets today. Interesting, Julie. So yields up. Investors, though, shrugging that off. You see stocks up to green across the screen right now. You mentioned earnings, and I and all of those were on deck, of course. I do wonder how much of what we're seeing to today is geopolitical, meaning the risk in the Middle East, the war between Iran and Hamas, and how much, at least right now, investors are, are betting on that as horrible as those headlines are that this risk stays contained. It stays limited. It doesn't spill over, drag Iran in, up uh, up in the energy markets. Because you're looking at other safe haven trades today as well, too. Gold is lower. And oil dropped, by the way, following last week's rally. Right. So also maybe some selling in treasuries is part and parcel of that, perhaps. Consumer discretionary is leading the pack here today, which is interesting and represents a comeback, right? Because it was a group that had underperformed last week. You mentioned earnings. Um, and there does seem to be some earnings optimism here that we could see positive earnings year over year for the first time since the third quarter of 2022. At least that's according to FactSet. They're looking at the numbers that we've gotten so far, and it is very early in this earnings season, to be clear. But right now, uh, we're looking at four-tenths of one percent as being the growth rate so far, which, again, would make the first time we've seen a positive reading since uh, the third quarter last year, we got a lot to go. And this, got week a lot is, to go. this week is really when it starts to heat up and we got a lot more numbers. Yeah, of course, and all the, on those calls, too, you're always looking for what's coming ahead, right? You want that guidance and color and commentary from the CEO and the CFOs. But listen, we got last week we had the banks fairly decent in the round. Today you had Chuck Sh Charles Schwab reporting beating that stock's popping. And then big tech kicking off this week with Netflix on Wednesday. I like that you're on a not just a first name, but a nickname basis. I almost said Chuck. Chuck. Yeah, Chuck, Chuck Schwab. Chuck yeah. Schwab. I Chuck like Schwab. it. Chuck Schwab. Go back like a long it. time. A long time. <laughs> so let's talk more about the big picture here for earnings, what it means for the markets right here as people are eyeing this big week ahead. To be more specific here, we've got more banks reporting Tuesday as well. Bank of America, Goldman Sachs. We've got airlines on tap, United and Alaska Airlines. And finally, two big ones in tech as well. Tesla and Netflix are going to be reporting after the bell on Wednesday. A big theme in last quarter's results warnings of a consumer slowdown. Should we expect to see that play out this quarter as well? Uh, for more on this, we now turn to uh, Shana Orzik-Sissel, who's the CEO of Banrian Capital Management. Um, Shana, thanks so much for being here. Um, so we're looking, as I mentioned, consumer discretionary stocks are actually doing well today. They're helping lead the gains. How are we feeling going into earnings season about what earnings are going to tell us about the sustainability of the consumer in particular? 
Well, you pointed out last quarter, a lot of companies warned that the consumer was stretched. We've seen some rise in debt and debt to drive spending with uh, mostly lower end and middle class consumers. Um, it will be interesting to see how that plays out in this earnings cycle if they continue to uh, remark that the consumer is stretched. Uh, inflation in particular, food inflation and the cost of gasoline is a major headwind for consumers in general. So. It, like you said, it would be interesting to see how that plays out as, you know, overall earnings estimates is for growth going into 2024, 12% growth to be exact. Um, and I'm not sure. I, I find that a little too optimistic personally. Um, I do think the consumer is starting to feel stretched, but it might be another quarter before we see that really come out in the numbers as student loan repayments really gets into to gear and other stressors really put pressure on the consumer. And Shana, earnings on deck, but I, you know, I'm sure you heard, uh, I was talking to Julie right before we brought you on about another issue that investors are trying to work through, which is new geopolitical risk, uh, war between Israel and Hamas. Right now, it seems like investors are placing the bet this stays contained. It doesn't spill over, it stays limited. I'm just curious how you as an investor are thinking, Shana, about that risk. I'm actually more concerned than the market seems to be. It doesn't seem like we're making much progress here. And we do have an issue here with, uh, you know, the negotiation of the other side. You know, Hamas itself is, is fragmented and not necessarily working in the best interest of the Palestinians. But that's a conversation for another time. I think between the war between Ukraine and Russia and this, this is an escalating tensions globally, and the Middle East is a hot spot that we should be concerned about. You know, there are several other countries that are impacted by this, and the, the Saudi-Israel normalization has been put on hold uh, for their relationship because of what's going on there. I think the market is shrugging this off as no big deal, when maybe they should be considering that this is a bigger deal than, the, than they are thinking. And do what about that, Shana? You know, we were talking about people pulling back on those traditional havens today, like gold, like mm -hmm. treasuries. Do you think that's a mistake? Should people be, you know, doing some hedging trades here? Well, I, I personally use a lot of liquid alternatives as diversifiers to kind of make my portfolio more defensive. So those are things like BTAL and MRSK, if I'm talking ETFs, FMF is another one that we use. You know, I'm looking more at those types of uncorrelated ways to provide diversification to a portfolio versus, you know, those traditional safe havens of gold and treasuries, which, you know, in the treasury market, there's the Fed aspect of it that is influencing uh, the pricing and the yields there. And, you know, gold has its own um, kind of supply demand issues. So for me, I I'm trying to be less correlated to traditional markets and things like FMF, MRSK and BTOL provide that kind of diversification for our clients. So I'm more in favor of using those kind of uh, um, investments as a defensive way to posture the portfolio versus, you know, the traditional safe ha havens that are out there. And Shana, given all these very powerful cross currents you're mentioning here, so Fed, geopolitical risk, um, we have earnings on deck. What's your general view of the equity market, Shana, right now? I think they're holding up quite well. The economy is showing to be continue to have be hotter than expected. Labor markets remain tight. Inflation remains sticky high. And as long as that continues, that's going to be a headwind to equities because we're always going to have the Fed as a concern. Now, there have been many Fed members and governors who have indicated that the Fed is done raising rates and they really want to see how this kind of plays out, which I think is, is smart, uh, but we want, don't want to get into a 1970s scenario where there's a lot of stop and go. The question really remains, is the Fed, when they say 2%, do they mean 2% or do they mean sub-3? Because the long-term average over the last 40 years for inflation is about 2.8%. So I think the realistic um, target should be if they can get inflation under 3%, that would be a win. And that is what I would consider as the best scenario for a soft landing. And they're not really communicating well, uh, you know, if that's what they're looking for. And I think that's really a risk because inflation does appear to be sticky high and there's really nothing in the growth numbers that are indicating that growth is slowing down, which is what we would really need to kind of get supply and demand back into equilibrium. 
until that happens, I'm concerned that there is downside in this market. Um, so let's get to some of your other investment ideas, right? You mentioned some of the liquid alts and the ETFs that you're playing them through. Um, I was struck by your choice of NVIDIA also in your stock picks, because if we're looking at a market that is on, on a little bit of delicate footing right now, and as we know, NVIDIA has been almost a rocket ship on this AI thesis, doesn't it get hit along with other growth stocks if things start to go south a little bit? That's certainly a risk, and I'm not saying I'm a huge fan of technology here. NVIDIA is kind of a special case, in my opinion. I followed this stock my entire career, so 20 plus years. Um, and I, I just think that there's not a lot of competition f with, uh, for what they provide. They have a very strong balance sheet. They have substantial cash, reserves much higher than their debt. Um, and quite frankly, this AI tailwind is not going to stop just because the economy slows down. It might, you know, be somewhat slower, but NVIDIA will continue to benefit as they are the largest um, provider of chips in that space. They lead that space. They really don't have any competition there. And so for that reason, I think NVIDIA can actually hold up quite well. If it did for any reason start to turn down, I would be a buyer of the stock. I continue to hold the stock. And I think that it is a stock that actually will, of the technology names, um, ride through this period quite well. The AI trend is not going away, and NVIDIA is the largest uh, benefactory of that particular trend. Um, so for me, it's still a stock that I hold. It's a stock I would buy more of on weakness. I just think the long-term trend is very favorable for their, them in particular, and that is not saying that I'm a huge fan of technology as a sector, but that stock in particular, I think, has a lot of tailwinds and will continue to do well regardless of economic conditions. All right, we'll be watching. Shana Orzik Sissel, thank you so much for joining us today, Shana. Thank you. Let's take a look at some trending tickers today. Check out Pfizer shares. They are up about almost 4% there in today's trade. That's despite lowering its 2023 sales forecast, which is being led by lower demand for its COVID-19 vaccine. But analysts say cost cuts, new drug launches could still drive growth. It's not the only COVID vaccine maker on the move. By the way, Moderna and Novavax are under pressure. So this one's interesting. So Pfizer cuts guidance, Julie. Demand for COVID shots and pills, not great relative to what they thought it would be. But investors seem to be taking some reassurance here. Um, from the Pfizer CEO offering what I think is, is what's driving some of this, saying a lot of uncertainties, he said, that were surrounding the COVID business are resolved or about to be resolved soon. Yeah, you know, CEO Albert Borla um, really, um, since the height of the um, pandemic was passed and Pfizer, of course, benefiting from that and helping with um, the vaccine and with Paxlovid, has been trying to pivot and get investors to focus on the rest of the business, sort of the message being we're not just a COVID company. So maybe this helps investors start to move past that, right, and, and indeed take that message perhaps on that they can move on from this exclusive focus. The cost savings helps, to your point as well. And those Paxlovid pills, the reason for the, the forecast being cut in part is because the government is giving the pills back. And those pills were being sold to the government, I think at an average of something like $530. I've also seen some analyst chatter today that they're worth more if Pfizer sells them in the private market. So maybe that's part of the what's helping as well. When it comes to Moderna, which is sticking by its same forecast, and when it comes to Novavax, which had a delayed decision from the EU on its vaccine, those companies don't do anything else yet, right? Uh, Moderna, yes, is trying to come up with a, a combination flu vaccine as well. Pfizer is a bigger company, has more other stuff. So I think that's what accounts for some of the different dynamics here. Sorry, that was very long-winded. No, it was great. <laughs> Here's one stat that did jump out yeah. of me. Pfizer now is saying just 17% of Americans are expected to get the COVID boosters, right. which really surprised me. I guess that's even lower for what I'm reading than the we thought just yes. last month. Now, I don't know how that compares to, for example, the flu shot, but I, I would assume, of course, flu shot would probably be a lot higher. But that stat jumped out at me. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. The uptake is less than than they had forecast not even that long ago. Yep. Um, let's talk about Charles Schwab, or Chuck Schwab, as you like to call it. <laughs> uh, those shares are in the green today. They've been helping lead the S&P 500 higher. That's after the brokerage giant reported earnings this morning. And it comes as the firm saying bank deposit outflows were slowing down 7% from the previous quarter, down more than that year over year, down 28% year over year. But still, that deposit drop was smaller than had been anticipated by analysts. And one of the other interesting things here is um, we've been seeing something happen at some of the banks, which Charles Schwab talked about, something they call cash sorting, which is people taking money from their cash deposits and putting it in higher yielding stuff like money markets. That's good for the people. It's not as good for Charles Schwab. And it says some of that activity is starting to slow down. Yeah, so this was, this was an expectations game story. So earnings right. beat, as you noted, pay, bank deposits did drop, but still beat what the street was looking for. City saying, telling their clients, results and September trends were a touch better than expected. They noted the recent negative sentiment in their words, and that is true. This has been a rough year for Charles Schwab. You remember back early in the year, the regional banking crisis, the stock got absolutely walloped, and it's still down hard here today. Yeah, it's down, and, and then the deposits are still down. Net interest revenue, which we talked a lot about at the other banks that we heard from on Friday being positive, was down 24% year over year. All right, but a pop today for Chuck, so. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on, J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs have kicked off coverage on Instacart today with a bullish view, and the stock is down about 1.2% here. Around half of the company's IP under, IPO underwriters have initiated coverage with their top ratings. That's despite the stock flatlining following its IPO debut. So Instacart, always interesting, Julie, because it makes its debut. Well-known brand. Um, we all know it. Some of us even gave it a shot during the pandemic, but had a decent bottom line, which we didn't always see. Um, the other side of the coin, though, growth had slowed. Mm -hmm. And the company said, well, that's macro, that's inflation, um, that's a tough comp. But I do remember at least some investors at the time saying that's also competition, and you've got a ton of it. But it is notable today. We did have some, some analysts weighing in, and they were generally positive. And it's also notable that the stock is down, even Correct. though they're generally positive, Correct. right? Yeah. So the, remember the IPO price was $30. The average price target of those who have initiated on the stock is now $34.14. There are a total of nine buys, seven holds, and one sell on Instacart of the various um, firms that have initiated coverage here. Some of them are, are more positive because the company has a newer advertising business that they say is gonna help matters. But again, you have a disconnect between what's happening with the actual stock and what the street is saying. So we'll see if that gap closes at some a, point. A lot of it has to do with the advertising business, which is interesting right, when you yeah. read through the notes. Um, analysts knowing this is the profitability driver of the company. Baird saying it's one of the most successful rollouts of retail media, perhaps only second to Amazon. So right. a very positive note, not a very positive reaction no, note today. Definitely not. All right, we're just getting started on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up next, we're going to be looking to earnings season and specifically Netflix, which is set to report its third quarter results after the bell Wednesday. We're going to talk to one analyst about the three things investors should watch out for. And pharmacy closure, Rite Aid filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy over the weekend. We're going to break down what went wrong. Also, travel trends will clue you in on when the best time to book holiday travel is. Hint, it's coming up, if not now. All that and more when Yahoo Finance returns.
Netflix kicking off tech earnings for the season with its third quarter report on Wednesday after the bell. Our next guest has his eyes on three key things in this report. Net number of subscribers added, average revenue per subscriber, and the company's plans for its struggling ad tier. Joining us now is Jason Helfstein, Oppenheimer Managing Director and Head of Internet Research. Jason, great to see you. So you are a Netflix believer, Jason. You got an outperform. I think your target is 470. Why are you bullish, Jason, heading into this report? It, you know, while there's been a lot of headlines about what they can't control, which is the rollout of their advertising business, they can control the rollout of paid sharing. And that's basically getting kind of uh, some of the more egregious sharers to either pay more money per month or get their own account. And they are purposely slow rolling that. And we think they wouldn't do that if they weren't otherwise confident in their guidance. So, um, you know, we think for the next few quarter, next two quarters, they've got pretty good control on, on kind of where the numbers play out. And then they've also told you that a pricing increase will, will come at the end of the Hollywood strike. Um, and Jason, hey, it's Julie here. Uh, give us a little more detail on those three things that you're looking for. And let's take the two first first, because they sort of go together here. How many subscribers are going to be added? And then the average revenue per member or per subscriber. Um, wh what are you looking for here from Netflix? So um, we have six million uh, new subscribers in the quarter. I think that the street is, is 5.6, and kind of if you look at the high end of the street, they're about six and a half, right? So I think there is a general view that they'll beat the overall street estimate. The question is how much they come um, higher than that. And then for, for revenue, um, basically per subscriber, you know, uh, Arm, we're basically flat year over year. Um, maybe it'll be a little bit better with currency, but. The, the pushback on the arm is that if ultimately you're getting more people to opt into paid sharing, right, pay for the unused accounts, why isn't it going up more than that? And there's a thought of are people downgrading from, let's say, a premium plan to a less premium plan, which the company is saying they're not, um, or, or kind of other factors, uh, as well as for folks who are moving into the ad tier, they're kind of behind plan on monetizing that. So to the extent if you do have somebody who, let's say, leaves the kind of the ad free through paid sharing and ends up on the advertising tier, they're not getting the full monetization in the advertising right now because that's going slower. So that's where the noise is in, in the numbers and ultimately that, that kind of revenue per subscriber they call it ARM. And, and just remind me on the ARM, between a premium subscriber and an ad tier subscriber, what's the, what's the ARM for each of those at this point? So, you know, they've, they've said to us at scale that advertising subscriber could do more than basically a, a standard subscriber. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, their standard right now is, is um, 1549. Um, you know, we'll also note that Disney did raise their price for, for Disney Plus by $3 from 1099 to 1399. Um, then you've got Netflix Premium is at $19.99. Um, and then that kind of, if you want to kind of compare it, um, you know, you have Hulu ad free at $17.99. You have Max Premium at $19.99. So it does look like all of the other companies have basically taken, you know, their premium tiers up in price and, and Netflix has not. So you have that opportunity. And again, we can talk about it. The advertising business is taking longer than they expected to roll out. You did have the departure of Jeremy Gorman, who was running that business that's been written about in the press. And and so, you know, that that is the challenge. I think they thought that they would be further along with an advertising uh, plan or, or an ad-supported plan than they are today. Jason, thanks a lot. We're looking forward to the numbers. Jason Helfstein, Oppenheimer Managing Director and Head of Internet Research. Thank you. Thank you. Tesla reporting earnings Wednesday after the close. All eyes will be on margins as the street predicts a drop in the third quarter following price cuts and slower sales in China. Pras Subramanian is senior autos reporter here at Yahoo Finance. So uh, tell us what we should be looking for here from Tesla. Hey, Julie. So, you know, kind of big numbers top line here. We're looking at 
$24.16 billion, about a 13.6% jump from a year ago, and adjusted e e uh, EPS of 74 cents a share, uh, but EBITDA of around 3.9 billion, which would be a 21% decrease from a year ago. Now, I'm watching three other big things here that are sort of, I think investors will be also watching as well. Uh, number one is delivery guidance. Uh, are they going to hit that 1.8 million uh, unit figure that, that they said they would hit? Uh, for 2023. They only delivered 435,000 cars last quarter, meaning they have to produce around 500,000 this quarter, I'm sorry, in Q4 to hit that mark, so we'll see if they can do that. It'll require a monster quarter to do so. Uh, watching for Cybertruck production and delivery news, they're supposed to have an event in Q3, that never happened. I think there's some anxious eyes here on when will that, when will that be, when will they actually begin production and when will we actually have the delivery event. Uh, finally, the Model 3 refresh that's out in certain markets, but it's not here in the U.S. just quite yet. Want to hear when that new refresh Model 3 will come. This car is sort of, sort of a little bit long in the tooth right now. It needs some improvements here, both inside and out, to sort of give that, that car a bit of a boost here, even despite the recent price cuts for that model. Praz, great stuff. Thank you for that. Thanks, man. And coming up, investors are awaiting SEC decision for Bitcoin ETF approvals. approvals. We're going to bring you the latest in that fight next.
Goldman Sachs analysts and top executives from across the technology, media and telecoms landscape are gathered in San Francisco for its annual Communicopia and Technology Conference. Next door is doing some pretty cool things on the AI front with our assistant and also with Vitality. For us, it actually starts to unleash unique data. We are the local knowledge graph. So I think the value of what we do starts to really shine forth. We're the only platform where you're finding out what's going on around you locally in real time. So with that data, we can do things like on the platform, help a neighbor compose a post in a way that is more engaging. So the assistant or the AI actually does that for you. There's lots of interesting discussion we can have around AI. So we announced just this morning, uh, Zoom AI Companion, which is our answer to how generative AI is gonna be included in our platform. And there's all kinds of really cool features that come with that for our paid subscribers. There are things like Chat Compose, if you're in a chat thread and you wanna be able to respond to that. There are things like Meeting Summaries, which after the fact help categorize and, and capture not only what happened in the meeting, but also the true sentiment. I think any creative would admit that AI is transformative to how they think about and how they concept new ideas. So I think it's gonna be very exciting. It's still early innings and we gotta figure out how to do it right. There's a lot of hype in our industry. I think this may be underhyped. I think it impacts things at so many levels. It impacts how we interact with computers and how they seem personal. It generates how art and media is created. It, it's a really a breakthrough in computer science and it impacts not only the products, but it impacts how software is created. There certainly needs to be a lot of debate about AI and journalism. 57% of newsroom jobs in the United States have been lost. We're facing uh, another wave, in this case a tsunami potentially of job losses uh, because of the impact of AI. And, and these are not ju just jobs lost, but it's insight lost. It's important that all media companies uh, understand the impact, but also it's incumbent on the big AI players to understand their impact. We launched Intuit Assist. Uh, and Intuit Assist is really a personalized, intelligent uh, assistant in your pocket. Uh, it's also uh, powered by AI-driven human experts uh, so that when you are getting assistance from Intuit Assist, if you ever need to talk to an expert, no matter what it is that you're doing, you're able to do that. So there's always a gateway uh, to help. AI is gonna change this whole industry completely. And so we're thinking a lot about how do we use AI to match people a lot better um, and to support the conversations that are happening. I think conversational AI is also a big opportunity because people do produce all these messages. So helping them craft those messages, make it easier to communicate, I think is, is something people will really appreciate as well. We are kicking off the third week of October with green across the board here as we look forward to big earnings results and Fed speak. Let's take a look at where things stand by sector. Yahoo Finance's Diane King Hall has that breakdown for us. Diane. Hey, Josh. Yeah, that's right. We've got really this broad base buying we're seeing on Wall Street uh, today with all 11 sectors of the S&P 500 really just staging an advance. I want to hone in on some sectors we're uh, focusing in on in terms of the leaders. want to take a look at consumer discretionary. So XLY, one of the leaders on the session, best performing. It's got a gain of a little more than, well, more than one and a half percent, approaching a two percent level now. Uh, among the key leaders with Within consumer discretionary, you've got VF Corp. That's the company behind well-known brands like North Face, Vans, Timberland. That stock gaining around 5% at the moment. Etsy, also among the consumer discretionary leaders on the session on the day. Uh, that stock gaining about 5%. Among the laggards there, you've got CarMax, which is uh, down a little bit. Uh, so it is one of the laggards in terms of consumer discretionary. Uh, another sector I want to hone in on in terms of the leaders for the day. We've got XLC, that's community communication services, uh, definitely among the best performers right now. That's up more than one and a half percent, up 1.6 percent there about on the nose. So following right on the heels of consumer discretionary in terms of the advance that we're seeing. And when you think about some of the weakness that we saw last week, that's red hot you hear yelling right now, uh, one of the traders on the floor. Um, consumer discretionary comms were among the laggards last week. And you think about how far they advance along with tech. So you can see why there was some weakness, but now you've got a little bit of a bid under them on this session. There was some weakness because they advanced so much uh, in, in the year. Uh, I want to take a look at XLE, that's energy 
energy. We were watching that last week. Obviously, it caught a big bid last week among the worries about uh, the war between Israel and Hamas. Right now, energy, XLE, seeing an advance, but much smaller when you compare it to, say, consumer discretionary, uh, communication services. Um, that is up more than a half a percent at the moment. Another uh, asset or measure I want to focus in on, the VIX, the volatility index. You saw a huge surge in the VIX last week, up more than 30 percent. Now, some of that volatility has cooled today, so the VIX is down 10 percent on the day. So that's certainly some of the sector action that we're watching on the session. And with that, I'll leave it there and send it back to you all. Julie and Josh. Thanks so much, Diane. Appreciate it. You got it. Well, Bitcoin is among the big movers on Wall Street today. Crypto has been seeing wild swings as investors wait on a decision from the Securities and Exchange Commission to approve spot Bitcoin ETFs. There was a report early on in the day that the SEC had approved the iShares ETF. Bitcoin spiked on that news but paired those gains after BlackRock said the fund was still under review. Joining us now, Matt Hogan, Bitwise Chief Investment Officer. He's got his hat in the ring as well um, with these offerings. And everybody's been waiting to see if approval was going to come, Matt. Um, what are you guys hearing? Any, any kind of glimmer of news from the SEC? And what do you think is the holdout here? Yeah, well, thanks for having me on. Of course, I can't speak to Bitwise's filing or any specific filing. But I do think the tea leaves are pointing toward a potential approval. You know, we have major issuers like BlackRock coming into the market saying we're ready for a spot Bitcoin ETF. Firms like Bitwise, who have been doing this for years, have submitted additional research into the space. I think the time is right for a spot Bitcoin ETF. The SEC has previously been worried about market manipulation, about a lack of maturity in the market. But the Bitcoin market of today is not the Bitcoin market of a few years ago. It's an institutional market with institutional players and institutional custody. And we're ready for an ETF that will make it cheaper and safer for Americans to invest in this exciting asset class. So, Matt, when do you think, and I realize, listen, you're reading tea leaves here, but when do you think the SEC could approve that spot Bitcoin ETF, Matt? Are you thinking, you know, by year end? And when they do, Matt, do you think they should, the SEC should approve all the Bitcoin ETFs here at once? Yeah, so the way this works is there's a calendar-based system for every ETF that is applied for. And the date I would circle on your calendar is January 10th. That's when the next ETF hits its final review date. The SEC has to say yes or no by that point. Towards the second part of your question, if we look at what happened in the Ethereum futures ETF space, where those ETFs just launched two weeks ago, what we saw was the SEC lined up multiple providers to launch at once. I suspect the most likely scenario is the SEC will want to do the same thing here, give everyone an equal starting place, increase competition, and so I would circle that January 10th date. I don't mean on that date. I mean sometime between now and that date, we will find out if we are finally going to get the CTF. Matt, it's so fascinating to me, the timing that all of this is sort of coming to a head, because it's the same time that Sam Bankman fried is on trial and that there's a lot of scrutiny about the sort of underbelly of crypto, if you will. Um, it doesn't seem to have dampened the chatter and the enthusiasm around the new product offerings that are coming. Why do you think that is? What, there's sort of an interesting juxtaposition here. It's a great point. And, you know, if you've been in this market for a number of years, Bitwise has been helping investors access crypto for almost six years. The reason it's having that unusual effect is we've seen this story before. When the SEC cracked down on illegal ICOs in 2018, that set the stage for the massive bull market we saw in 2019, 2020, and 2021. When we saw Silk Road shut down and the sort of Mt. Gox collapse, we cleared out that infrastructure mess. That set the stage for the huge rally we saw in 2015, 2016, and 2017. So long-term crypto investors have seen this story before. You deal with the excesses of the past, you, you wash those out of the system, and you build from a stronger foundation. That's what we're doing here, out with the FTX, in with the ETF, and in with the mainstream era of crypto. That's why we've been rallying all year. Bitcoin's the best performing asset class in the world this year, up almost 70%. And I think uh, we're, we're set up well for the next couple of years to come. Matt, all due respect, gosh, I've heard that story before, right? I mean, even when it hasn't been accompanied by a big event, it, 
not necessarily not you, but like people who love Bitcoin always love Bitcoin and say it's going to go up over the long term, no matter what is happening in the external world. And also, when you talk about the washout, I mean, the the one surrounding FTX, who knows what's going on with Binance? We're talking about larger numbers here than we were in those past situations. I think that's a reasonable thing, and I like that you flagged Binance. There are still some things to worry about in the crypto space, to be sure. There's Binance to worry about. There's, you know, people have concerns about Tether. There's risk in the U.S. regulatory ecosystem. So this is not a riskless investment. Bitcoin is extremely volatile. Crypto is extremely volatile as well. But it is worth noting that we have rallied almost from the day that FTX's news came out as if people were waiting for the worst of the news to get out before we built a new base forward. So I'm not saying there's any guarantee that we continue to rally from here, but I'm saying that if you look at the balance of the, the pros and the cons, the likelihood of a spot Bitcoin ETF versus the likelihood of another one of these negative black swans, I feel a lot more confidence that we're moving into ETF land, moving into a mainstream era. So is it risk-free? Of course not. But is there significant opportunity and upside? Of course. And that means that investors should size their pro portfolio appropriately, not hold more Bitcoin than they can afford to lose. But it doesn't mean you should ignore this space because a lot of institutions, a lot of financial advisors are coming into the market. And that leaves me pretty excited for the next 12 and 24 months. And Matt, that actually leads me on my next question. If and when the SEC, Matt, approves these spot Bitcoin ETFs, where would you think the investor interest is really going to come from here? Do you think it's, is it retail investors, Matt? Is it institutional investors? Is it RIAs? Where do you think? Yeah, it's absolutely RIAs. Look, retail investors can already access crypto. You can buy Bitcoin on your phone. You can buy it through PayPal. You can buy it through Coinbase. But financial advisors can't. And the important thing to remember is that financial advisors control about the same amount of money as mainstream institutions and two or three X as much money as self-directed retail investors. The really only way we can get that chunk of the market, which is you know many trillions of dollars, is through an ETF. And I think therefore the ETF will transform the market. The analogy I would make is back to the approval of spot gold ETFs in 2004. Before that, retail investors could buy gold, but advisors couldn't. And what you saw eventually is $100 billion move into gold ETFs over a period of 10 years. That was, of course, positive for prices. We got 11 straight up years in gold. I'm not saying that will happen in Bitcoin, but I do think you'll see financial advisors move into this market in mass, and I think that will be positive for the asset class. Finally, Matt, I do want to ask you a question about competition within the ETF market, because there are a lot of proposals out there, a lot of uh, companies trying to get their offerings out there. Of course, there's Grayscale, which already has its trust on the market. Um, and so we'll see if people convert that. We've got BlackRock, which is a giant in the industry. And if you look at other commodity ETFs, while there might be a bunch out there, usually there's one that's sort of far and away the leader. So how do you compete in a market like that? The beautiful thing about Bitwise competing in the crypto market is it's all we do 24-7, 365. And as you know, the news in this market moves extremely fast. I think when advisors want to choose someone to partner with to access the crypto market, they're going to want to make sure that they're following the news in Washington, that they're on the phone with technologists, that they're talking to venture capitalists. So if they have questions, the provider will have answers. So Bitwise feels comfortable moving into this space. We're excited for the race to begin. And, you know, the more the merrier. May the best, uh, best team win. All right, Matt Hogan, thank you so much for joining us today, man. That was great insight. Thanks for having me. And coming up, a new report shows iPhone 15 sales in China are down compared to the initial sales of the iPhone 14. We're going to break down the data with the researcher who reported it that comes after the break.
Goldman Sachs analysts and top executives from across the technology, media and telecoms landscape are gathered in San Francisco for its annual Communicopia and Technology Conference. Next door is doing some pretty cool things on the AI front with their assistant and also with Vitality. For us, it actually starts to unleash unique data. We are the local knowledge graph, so I think the value of what we do starts to really shine forth. We're the only platform where you're finding out what's going on around you locally in real time. So with that data, we can do things like on the platform, help a neighbor compose a post in a way that is more engaging. So the assistant or the AI actually does that for you. There's lots of interesting discussion we can have around AI. So we announced just this morning, uh, Zoom AI Companion which is our answer to how generative AI is going to be included in our platform. And there's all kinds of really cool features that come with that for our paid subscribers. There are things like Chat Compose, if you're in a chat thread and you want to be able to respond to that. There are things like Meeting Summaries, which after the fact help categorize and, and capture not only what happened in the meeting, but also the true sentiment. I think any creative would admit that AI is transformative to how they think about and how they concept new ideas. So I think it's gonna be very exciting. It's still early innings and we gotta figure out how to do it right. There's a lot of hype in our industry. I think this may be underhyped. I think it impacts things at so many levels. It impacts how we interact with computers and how they seem personal. It generates how art and media is created. It, it's a really a breakthrough in computer science and it impacts not only the products, but it impacts how software is created. There certainly needs to be a lot of debate about AI and journalism. 57% of newsroom jobs in the United States have been lost. We're facing uh, another wave, in this case a tsunami potentially of job losses uh, because of the impact of AI. And, and these are not ju just jobs lost, but it's insight lost. It's important that all media companies uh, understand the impact, but also it's incumbent on the big AI players to understand their impact. We launched Intuit Assist. Uh, and Intuit Assist is really a personalized, intelligent uh, assistant in your pocket. Uh, it's also uh, powered by AI-driven human experts uh, so that when you are getting assistance from Intuit Assist, if you ever need to talk to an expert, no matter what it is that you're doing, you're able to do that. So there's always a gateway uh, to help. AI is gonna change this whole industry completely. And so we're thinking a lot about how do we use AI to match people a lot better, um, and to support the conversations that are happening. I think conversational AI is also a big opportunity because people do produce all these messages. So helping them craft those messages, make it easier to communicate, I think is, is something people will really appreciate as well. The Apple iPhone 15 is not selling as well in China as the iPhone 14 did. It's according to a new report from CounterPoint Research that looks at sales in the first 17 days after the product's launch. And the report points to China's economic woes as a main cause here. For more on this, we turn to the author of that report, CounterPoint Research Director Jeff Fieldhack. So, Jeff, doesn't sound like good news uh, for Apple here. What are the reasons? I mean, one sounds like perhaps a shaky Chinese economy, but what are the variables here at work? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, a lot of the same story as, as um, higher unemployment of young people, with, which would really drive uh, Apple sales. But there are other headwinds for Apple. One, the China, the China smartphone market, we estimate, is down 5%. So in that respect, Apple's holding serve uh, also being down about 5%. The other maybe more, uh, the other major reason is uh, Huawei. Huawei has a 5G device out, Mate Pro 60, and that device uh, is now taking a bit of that premium segment that, that Apple uh, really owned um, last year. And also the other, Oppo, Vivo, Xiaomi, also have foldables. They are not huge volume drivers, but um, you know, taking all these total headwinds, it does come up to about a 5% a drop year over year, we estimate. Hey Jeff, I'm curious, without getting you to give away anything proprietary, how do you guys figure this stuff out? How the, the sales are go going thus far? Yeah, we do multiple channel checks at the supply uh, uh, chain level. Um, a lot of our data, is uh, import export data. Um, we have some uh, of looks in some countries with some map data. So there are 
uh, multiple um, sources we triangulate to, to get Apple estimates. And Jeff, I'm, inter I'm interested in why you think uh, Huawei might be taking a bite here. Do you think there's this growing nationalism among Chinese consumers? Um, I asked Jeff because I remember Apple bulls reacting to when Huawei came out with that new device and some were saying, you know, they kind of shrugged it off. They said, listen, once you're in Apple's ecosystem, you don't leave, it's sticky. What are some reasons you think um, Huawei could be having some success, success here? Yeah, the first, the, the ecosystem is a little weaker in China. A lot, uh, a lot of these applications are not allowed there. So that's the first obvious reason. Um, you know, there is certainly nationalism. Uh, you know, we, while we did have devices, and even the 4G devices are selling a little bit better. And now that they have a 5G device, even if the specs and the chip and uh, the node is not uh, uh, you know, it's a year, two years behind Apple. It still is drawing in consumers. Our research uh, and testing of the device, the device is solid. If you are not an avid gamer, uh, you know, the camera technology is, is, is great on the device. Uh, you know, you might not notice, um, um, you know, some, some of the areas where the overall device is hardware is behind Apple and, uh, for example, Samsung. And Jeff, all of this said about demand for the phones in China, your data also showed that things in the U.S. are actually going okay. Can you walk us through those numbers? Yeah, we are seeing, um, yeah, and to put it in perspective, the, the North America market is much larger uh, than the China market. So we're at about 23 million in the North America market and about 17 million in the China market. So. This weakness could be offset by the North America market. The, the carriers and their promotions are on par with last year. We are finding the media spend on both TV and online is actually larger. And there's a lot of competition in the, the U.S. market with the cable players getting into wireless. And that's uh, further pushing you know, uh, T-Mobile, AT&T, and Verizon. And Jeff, I'm interested that, you know, so your report covers these 17 days. Do you think investors should, you know, who are listening right now, should they try to extrapolate, okay, that's 17 days, what it might mean for that all important December quarter, that holiday quarter for Apple? Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, there are always lots of moving parts in what supply is, and we're really tracking, um, you know, supply up or down versus last year, and we are seeing it slightly higher. Uh, the, the wait periods uh, globally are a bit longer. So it's all what can be delivered in those last three weeks, which is um, always the case. But um, our estimates are showing that, uh, you know, the supply is in a slightly better situation this year uh, than last year overall, but the wait times are a little longer. Jeff Fieldhack, thank you so much for joining us today, Jeff. Pleasure. And coming up, closing bell on Wall Street. We're going to be checking in on the latest market moves. The top t trending tickers stay tuned. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news, three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. All right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Investor Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light and space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance.
Wall Street on this Monday. Let's do a quick check of the markets here. Feels like it's a bit of a pause before all the action coming this week on the earnings front. Uh, we've got all three major averages in the green throughout the session. The Dow lending the day higher by more than 300 points, about nine tenths of one percent. The S&P up a percent and the Nasdaq up 1.2 percent. And let's take a look inside the uh, Yahoo Finance Interactive for some of the uh, story behind those numbers. One of the things that was interesting to me today, how remarkably consistent the day was. Yes, you had a leg up early in the morning and then kind of sideways action throughout the day. That was true not just for stocks, but for bonds as well today, where we had some selling in the bond market, driving yields up about eight basis points on the 10-year. Uh, that is to about 4.71 percent. So interesting to see that action there. As we talked about earlier in the day, while the action was very consistent uh, when it came to what was going on in stocks, not so for Bitcoin, right? Yep. Because we had that um, report this morning that uh, the iShares Bitcoin ETF had been approved and then the company BlackRock saying, nope, not, uh, it's still under review. So there we saw some volatility. But otherwise, you look at oil, a little bit of deterioration, but really not much activity there, Josh, which was interesting. I've also been watching the trending tickers here. Now that we're starting to get a little bit into earnings season, we're definitely going to start to see more of these pop up. Lululemon, though, getting a boost. It was added to the S&P 500. Um, and uh, that was because Activision Blizzard coming out after it was uh, acquired uh, by Microsoft. So all of the funds and ETFs that index against the S&P 500 then had to add uh, Lululemon. Snap, I know this is one you were watching on the day, right? Yeah, Snap. Well, this came from a report from The Verge we got, got its hands on the CEO letter and came out with some targets, and that certainly moved, moved it sharply higher. Of course, if you look at a year-to-date of Snap's chart, you would see a roller coaster, right? It's been a, a tough ride. Yeah. Getting back to earnings, though, I mean, we have those names to think about, too, today. The earnings season off to what looks like a pretty decent start. I mean, Charles Schwab reported today, look at that, jumped almost 5%. Of course, that comes after late last week. We heard J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo, United Health, they report in rows. Yes. So we'll see what's coming. Yeah, and then also wanted to look at the sectors just quickly here uh, in the S&P 500 because there, too, there was some interesting action. All of the groups in the green, by the way, but consumer discretionary leading the pack higher. We are going to be getting retail sales, so could be interesting to hear what those say. That's uh, tomorrow, I believe. Communication services also leading on the day. And a lot of strength in large cap tech here. Apple in the red. We were just talking about a report on sales of the iPhone in China. But otherwise, a lot of strength here within the fangs. Green everywhere. Yeah, exactly. Let's talk about one of those stocks in particular, Microsoft. Those shares uh, closed higher on the day, up 1.5%. A couple of things going on here. On the one hand, a company uh, said that LinkedIn, which is a unit of Microsoft, had laid off almost 700 employees in its second round of cuts this year. Um, also, Microsoft overall getting some praise from Piper Sandler, which flagged it as the highest conviction large cap stock to own. So that seemed to be helping those Microsoft shares, even as kind of 
two things going on today for yeah, you. Yeah, over there you have, uh, at Pipe, you've got Brent Bracelin, longtime analyst, saying the company's first mover advantage in generative AI is what he's in part calling out here. So he's overweight, his price target is 400. And then we did also get that, as you know, that LinkedIn news as well, Microsoft cutting about 668 roles. So even more attention, I think, now on Microsoft's earnings report. That'll be a key question. They're going to give you, they're going to tell you how LinkedIn is performing and tell you what the outlook is for that business segment. Yeah, and that uh, earnings report is due on October 24th. So we still have a little uh, time to wait for that. Did you? I'm not sure if you mentioned Brent Bracelin's uh, price target on the stock. Yeah, it is. Four hundred dollars. Four hundred. Yeah. So, and a nice run for the stock this year. You're up about 40% year to date. Right, so looking for yet more upside. All right, shares of Overstock. Let's check out that one too. Jumping today uh, after the hedge fund JAT Capital Management disclosed a 9% stake in the company. The firm run by John Thaler said the discount retailer should consider selling certain assets and overhauling its management. They may seek board seats if they are ignored. They will not be ignored, Julie. That's not going to happen. Yeah, it's, it does well, seems. I mean, Overstock has been such an interesting story this year, right? And it's it, not just this year, but sort of over the life of the company, sort of known as a cast-off, uh, re, a retailer selling discount cast-offs, and then has pivoted in more recent years to be a sort of more mainstream um, decor retailer, then acquiring the Bed Bath & Beyond name online. And so even though the company now is called Overstock, the website is Bed Bath & Beyond, and it sells a lot of the merchandise that was once offered by Bed Bath & Beyond. So um, it's been an interesting journey for Overstock, and now it's an interesting moment for an activist like this to get involved with the company. See that two-year stock, look, uh, two-year chart, I should say, looks pretty ugly. We'll see if JAT and John Thaler can make any... Yeah, and it sounds like, they, listen, they're making suggestions, and if they don't listen to these suggestions, they may have a proxy fight on their hands. Right, yep. so we'll, we'll have to see what happens with that company. And then we are also looking at Vista Outdoor, the stock ending the day down by 24% after it cut its full-year sales target and announced it would sell its sporting products business for $1.91 billion. The company says earnings X some items are now going to be um, at most 405 a share, before the bottom end of its forecast was $4.50. Um, and by the way, sporting products is a euphemism as far as I can tell. It mostly includes ammunition, yep. right? Um, so that it looks like that that is the, the business that it is offloading. Big, brand, big, big, big ammunition brand, so Federal, Remington. It, it is interesting. The team at B. Riley, they've been covering this name for a long time. They are still optimistic here. Improvements in market share, underlying product demand. They did reiterate their buy to their clients. Price target's 47, they say. Well, and the business that they're holding on to, the outdoor products business, also has a lot of kind of iconic, well-known outdoor names. They own Camelback, you know, the water uh, sleeves and bottles. Uh, Bushnell, as well as Bushnell Golf, is something that they own as well, which I recognize. Um, and then there's some other sort of, I guess, I, I actually don't know what Gunmate is, but I assume mm. it's something gun-related. doesn't include the ammunition stuff that is uh, getting sold. I remember during, um, it was like 2021, you know, it was, it was during the pandemic, and a lot of people were rediscovering the outdoors. They were going camping, hiking, hunting. And I remember a lot of investors and folks on the street were saying this was one name to play in. Yeah, well, sure. as we know, a lot of normalization has been positive and negative, depending on the name you're talking about. That is true. All right, moving on. Markets starting the week on an upbeat note, but we're gearing up for a busy week for both earnings and Fed speak. While many see the Fed nailing a soft landing for that, our next guest says the economy is actually on the path for a slow takeoff. Joining us now is David Royal, Thriven Chief Financial Officer and Chief Investment Officer. So I've heard soft landing, hard landing, no landing, David. What is a slow takeoff, though? Walk me through that. Sure. Well, the economy's only had four recessions in the last 40 years, so it would be unusual for us to head into a recession uh, this, say, three years into an expansion. And so we certainly had some uh, growth pulled forward through the fiscal and monetary policy post-COVID, and we've had to slow that down. You know, we've had 500 basis points or so of rate hikes, and the economy is slowing, but we're at a point in the cycle where uh, I think the economy actually has some, some good fundamental momentum. Uh, things we're seeing in the private markets, the private equity markets and so forth, uh, give me some optimism, and as well as what we're seeing in the yield curve, that with longer-term rates going up, I think that's actually signaling some fundamental strength in the economy. 
Um, I'm curious, David, you know, there are a lot of folks who are pointing to potential areas of weakness. You know, we were hearing a lot about uh, student uh, debt repayment that was coming back online, for example, people's savings being worked down, um, et cetera. Do you think that those negatives were sort of overhyped, or do you think it's just that they're overwhelmed by some of the more positive uh, impacts? Yeah, I think there's a natural unwinding going on in the economy. I mean, most by most measures, people have drawn down their savings somewhere around August, September, maybe October, the excess savings above the pre-COVID trend. And we've seen some effects of that. You know, people are putting more on their credit cards. We've seen credit card delinquencies go up, nowhere near what we saw in, say, uh, 2007. Uh, but the economy is, uh, consumer is, is facing uh, some additional stress. But, you know, some of the, the, the points of uh, strength, I'd say, is, you know, we have actually $10 trillion more in home equity than we had in early 2019. And there's less than half the home equity loans outstanding. So the consumer still has a pool of assets and equity it can draw from going forward. And Dave, interested in your take too on this geopolitical risk, Israel's war with Hamas, um, and how you're thinking about that as an investor. We did have Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, David, today. He's cautioning Iran and Hezbollah not to get involved. He said, saying if they do, the price they pay will be much heavier. We had a guest on earlier, David, who was saying maybe investors are being a, maybe a bit too complacent with how they're thinking about this conflict. How are you thinking about it? We're certain, certainly paying close attention, and it's it's a horrible uh, humanitarian crisis. And you know, our thoughts and prayers are, are with all the uh, the innocent folks involved. Uh, but you know, markets tend to recover from geopolitical events fairly quickly, uh, even significant ones. All eyes are on Iran. Whether Iran would uh, get involved, that would certainly escalate. But even major geopolitical events in the past, markets have gone down pretty quickly. But then they've often. Uh, recovered fairly promptly. Uh, one of the exceptions was in uh, the 1970s, of course, with the uh, oil crisis, which put pressure on inflation. And we're in a very different spot now in terms of oil. As you know, domestic production has significantly increased. We're actually net exporters of oil. So we're in a very different position now uh, than we are in the 1970s. Uh, and, you know, markets' jobs are to assess the long term economic impacts of geopolitical events. And uh, while we're watching it closely, uh, I would be looking for buying opportunities. In the market. Interesting. In oil specifically? I think probably in the overall or in general, market. When it comes uh, to stocks. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, areas that we find, I think, attractive in this market, uh, if, I, if, I, if I'm right and we are going through the slow takeoff and we're going to avoid a recession in 2024, you'd want to be in some of the more cyclical names. And one area that I think is attractive is small caps. They're historically undervalued compared to large caps. Uh, they have more leverage uh, than, than, than large cap companies for the most part, uh, which means they would do well in a strengthening economy. And so looking at small caps, I'd probably look to be, if I was gonna add another point of equity, that's probably where I would add it right now is in small caps. And David, I know you're watching the housing market closely as well, and home builders is one of the areas I believe you're interested in. Um, the housing market is sort of so fraught right now with mortgage yep. rates pushing higher, but prices not really coming down very much in order to make things more affordable. Where do home builders fit into that picture for you? Yeah, so the market's really tight because supply of existing homes is, is, is diminished because with interest rates so high, if you have a 3 or 4% mortgage, you're not going to put your home on the market. So the supply of existing homes has decreased dramatically. And that's even a situation where we have, have had significant household formation that we haven't kept up with. And that really goes back to the financial crisis. There wasn't as much uh, home construction after the financial crisis. And then of course, uh, during COVID, it slowed down. So the right now, the, the, the greatest percentage of homes being bought are actually new construction because you're not getting those existing homes to come to the market. And so I think that presents an opportunity for home builders. They ran hard earlier this year uh, and they've since come down, depending on the home builder, 20, 25 percent from their peaks. Uh, so I think they're attractive on a secular multi-year basis. David Royal, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Well, in the United States, there's a great push for renewable energy, the country passing a sweeping set of renewable energy incentives, and more and more Americans are looking to buy an electric vehicle. Yet, oil is dominating geopolitics and an escalating Middle East war, much as it has for the last 75 years. Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman has a story, Rick, um, and you write about sort of the persistence of oil, which the oil companies themselves would tell you, you know, it's not going anywhere, which is why you see things like Exxon making the deal it just made. 
Right. I mean, it's really astonishing in a way uh, because we are making all the same calculations in the Middle East today as we would have made uh, 60, 70 uh, years ago. Uh, we've gone to war how many times in the Middle East in 1990, 91 because of Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. We went again because of terrorists, but our in 2003. But this is it's just amazing the extent to which everything revolves around oil. And we are clearly moving away from fossil fuels. Uh, you know, electric vehicles are the fastest growing segment of the car market. Biden just signed into law last year, the most sweeping incentives for renewable energy ever in U.S. history. And yet, here we are again. Oil is driving the whole agenda in the Middle East and uh, all of these concerns about an escalating Middle East war. The main reason they matter, I mean, it would be ugly and there would be, it would be a humanitarian catastrophe, but the reason it is a uh, paramount U.S. national interest is because of oil. And uh, Iran is the linchpin here. Iran, interestingly, only produces about 4% of the world's oil, but you had Lindsey Graham over the weekend saying uh, we, we might consider shutting down Iran's oil industry. Um, this would have pr profound effects here in the United States through the, the, the familiar old lever of energy prices and gasoline prices to include possibly threatening Joe Biden's uh, re-election in 2024 if uh, oil prices were to go above 100. If we have a real war in the Middle East, they could easily go above 150. And we're talking about gasoline, gasoline prices here of $6 or $7 a gallon. Now, none of this is inevitable, and you know there are a lot of things uh, President Biden and other world leaders can do, but it's almost like we're having uh, the same conversations we had in the 1970s and 1980s. Yeah, although we did talk to Ed Morris of City last week, and he talked about that there are more sort of supply levers, if you will. There's more strategic petroleum reserve capacity, not just here, but in other SPRs around the, the globe, I guess. But, you know, I think all of that goes out the window if you've got rhetoric that gets heated up, not just that you know, sort of marginal capacity that you talked about Iran having, but if then the region as a whole gets drawn into something larger. Right. I mean, there are many scenarios here. Uh, you know, so from the uh, on the scary uh, scenario, um, if, if, if there were some kind of concerted effort to uh, take Iran's oil uh, business offline, Iran has attacked uh, oil facilities in Saudi Arabia before. Iran has threatened to shut the Strait of Hormuz where all those tankers taking oil from Kuwait and other Persian Gulf nation, nation, nations sail through. So uh, the good news is, as the prior guest was saying, you know, the United States is now the world's largest oil producer, um, which was obviously not the case in the 1970s, the 1980s. But guess who the um, world's swing producer is, the, the country that can uh, quickly produce more oil if the world needs more oil? That is not the United States. That is Saudi Arabia. And the reason is that the Saudis and most of the other OPEC nations have nationalized oil in industries where the government decides. We do not have that here in the United States. The government does not tell Exxon or Chevron, hey, we need you to drill more oil because there's a crisis in the Middle East. That's a market decision these companies make. And they certainly can produce more oil here in the United States, and they do, uh, but they do that for economic reasons when the price is high. Um, so if we did get uh, a, a spike in oil prices, we would see more U.S. production, which would help bring prices down at some point. But um, it's just we still are surprisingly stuck dependent on oil. And I will also just one thing I'll finish up with here, guys, you know, uh, forecast for peak oil. We're not there yet. We are we are still not at peak world demand for oil. That might come around 2030. Um, and then sort of slowly drift down from there. But this is a problem we're just going to be dealing with for a long time. Rick Newman, thank you for that insight, sir. See you. And coming up, Rite Aid filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy on Sunday. We'll break down the fallout with a restructuring specialist next.
Rite Aid has filed for bankruptcy following years of falling sales, a huge debt load, and, a lo and looming opioid lawsuits. It's the latest in some of America's best-known brands declaring bankruptcy this year. They include the likes of Bed Bath & Beyond, Pyrex, and Party City. Let's bring in David Berliner. He is National Leader of Restructuring and Turnaround Services Practice at BDO. So obviously you're uh, well aware of some of the factors going on in the retail industry right now that have led to some of these bankruptcies and could maybe lead to others. What are you watching sort of most closely here, and particularly given your historical experience with bankruptcies, what is this environment indicating to you about what could happen next? Well, a lot of it has been geared for these retail bankruptcies to how the consumer is doing. And you know, we, we have a bunch of factors now with high inflation, interest rates being up, you know, that are making it uh, somewhat difficult for consumers to, to purchase. So we've been seeing consumers focusing on essential goods and cutting back on discretionary goods. And many of the bankruptcies we've seen this year have been for retailers that sold primarily discretionary goods. And so is that, given those sort of headwinds for consumers, and is that how retailers are responding, David? How, how are they reacting? Are you seeing them, um, is it more restructurings, more bankruptcies? How are they responding? Well, I think what retailers are trying to do are drum up sales. So a lot of it has to do with, you know, discounting to try to bring consumers in. Amazon just had its prime sale and other retailers uh, matched that last week. And uh, I think we're seeing with the holiday season coming, a lot of retailers may need to the discount in order to bring people in to, to, to purchase um, and, and buy the goods that they need this holiday season. And is holidays kind of the make or break for a lot of these retailers at a time when there are some vulnerabilities among the consumer? Absolutely. Uh, the old Black Friday, the Friday after Thanksgiving, it's the first day historically when retailers made money. And you know, today it isn't quite that way, but the fourth quarter of the holiday season is the pivotal time for most retailers. And I think what we're gonna see is there are gonna be winners and losers this holiday season. You know, as consumers tighten up some of the purchases they might be making, you know, some retailers will uh, survive and do well and others won't. And, and that uh, will dictate, I think, some of the retailers that may end up flowering for bankruptcy, you know, probably after the holiday season. And Dave, what's going to decide, do you think, the variables of who survives and who doesn't? Is it, does it come down to like who has, who has a smaller physical footprint, a stronger online presence? What do you think? Well, I think it's a combination of all those factors. I think the ones most at risk are the ones who sell primarily discretionary goods right now because consumers are, are focused on essentials, getting the things they need. And, and I think for the holiday season, you know, a lot of retailers think, there's going to be a tempering by consumers and how much gifts they, they purchase. So I think the, the ones that are going to be in trouble are retailers with a lot of debt who are seeing sales depressed. You know, you've seen a lot of retailers this year reporting, you know, sales decreases except for those in the discount dollar space and others that, that sell discretionary goods. Those are the ones that, um, you know, are probably going to be at risk and have some difficulty this holiday season. So, David, I'm looking at the data that you guys have come out with on the number of retail bankruptcies through the middle of the year this year, 13 of them in retail that you guys have tracked. Um, and that's it looks like we're on track for the highest year since 2020, which understandably there were quite a number that year because things were shut down. What do you, do you have a projection for the number of bankruptcies you think we'll end up seeing this year within retail? Let me just clarify that 13 was through June 30th. And we're up to 18 right. now with Rite Aid filing. So, you know, the, as you can see, we're well above last year in 2021. We're, we're close to 2019 pre-pandemic where there were 21. And again, our tracking of our more major retailers, not every retailer. But yeah, we're not going to hit the 35. But I do think, you know, usually the number of retailers that file in November and December uh, are fewer than, than you would see in the first quarter. So I think if we, you know, we make it to the end of this month, there won't be as many for the rest of the year. It's the first quarter of next year where we might see you know, an uptick based on how these retailers do uh, the, this fourth quarter. You know, um, one of the other things that has characterized this year, David, has been a shrinking of footprints, right? We talked about Rite Aid filing, but its competitors, Walgreens and CVS, have closed stores 
We've heard about Target closing stores in some urban areas as well. Now, some closures are always, you know, they tend to happen. Is the U.S. still overstored, so to speak? Are there too, still too many retail outlets for a lot of these companies? Yeah, I think there's a number of factors. We're still probably a few too many uh, overall, but also the pandemic has changed the way consumers work. There's hybrid work. They're not working downtown as much. So consumers are, are looking to shop differently than they did pre-pandemic. So they're looking to go more to their neighborhood stores, neighborhood centers, strip malls, less to major, major malls. And the retailers are reacting to that. So you're seeing um, national mall-based retailers closing some national mall stores and, and opening in strip centers and neighborhood centers and downsizing the square footage of some of these stores so they can be more nimble, carry products that sell more quickly. So that's changing the overall dynamic a little bit. And I think we're going to see that trend continue. A lot of retailers have done really well in the omni-channel, you know, having some retail and relying on e-commerce for, for some of the rest of their goods. So I do think we're going to see that that trend continue into the next year or two. We'll be watching it. David Berliner from BDO, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Bye now. All right, coming up, we're going to go around the horn with some of today's top stories, including Nepo homebuyers. That's a new one. That's homebuyers who use family money to afford down payments. That's coming up after the break. Okay.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. Josh Schaefer here with Alexandra Canal and Pross Supermanian. And we're breaking down some of our favorite trending stories of the day, some stories that caught our eye. And we've got Pross here with us, which means we got to talk cars. Pross, tell us about what is going on in the autos world. Yeah, sort of more bad news in the world of EVs potentially. Uh, here in this case, Ford confirming that they're shutting down a, a production shift for their F-150 Lightning, that, that really well-received uh, EV pickup. Uh, basically, you've seen this number right here, Q3 sales down almost 50%, not a good number there. But basically, Ford saying, we're shutting out a shift there for temporarily for the Lightning uh, due to supply chain issues, due to some sort of delivery uh, back um, sort of holdups they had before. But um, the Wall Street Journal reported that the, a UAW member said that it's no surprise, quote, that the sales are tanking as to, as to why they shut the, to cut down the shift. So there's a little bit of a concern there. Is it a demand issue? Is it a pricing issue? Is it just people don't want EVs? That's sort of the big kind of concern here. Um, and I think that we have four earnings coming up this week or next week too, so that's something to watch there. The question is, can they kind of keep this transformation going? A lot of money being spent on this transformation. They've also cut back on a battery factory in Michigan. So a little bit up in the air, a little bit dicier. It Pross, that's the best selling pickup truck in America. The normal F-150, right, is the yeah. best selling pickup truck in America. Yeah. yeah. And so that's what makes me wonder, is the EV Lightning hitting the right consumer as far as is it the F-150 driver? Or is it people that like EVs and think EVs are cool? Which there is a sector of the country that clearly likes EVs and thinks EVs are cool. Go out on the road, you'll see a Tesla. And I just wonder if people that drive Teslas don't want to drive an F-150 Lightning, right, because Tesla's more of a fun... It, I, I, Tesla's more of a, a sexy company, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of an EV company that EV drivers are attracted to versus if Ford is trying to get the traditional pickup driver to get an F-150 Lightning, we just haven't fully seen that in the market yet, right? There hasn't been yeah. that many EV pickups. Yeah, and I think for Ford, there's just a lot of competition in the EV space mm -hmm. with, you mentioned Tesla. I mean, they're the leader in this space. You also have other competitors like GM getting more and more into the EV game. And Praz, the other week we were talking about the Yahoo Finance poll mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. showed, you know, a lot of people are hesitant to go out and buy EVs for a variety of factors like you mentioned, the price probably being number one there, but also the infrastructure and not being sure of the charging stations there's there's a lot of unknowns when you think about the future here and it seems like we're still early days in full EV adoption yeah there's a lot of moving parts here right so the the, the lightning is a great truck a great product but can you charge it? Where can you charge it? That's kind of a problem. Um, is there sort of like a, a virtue thing, signal thing going on with, with trucks versus, versus mm -hmm. Tesla? And do truck drivers want to be seen in an EV truck? I think Ford maybe underestimated that effect in terms of buyers that would, that would go for that. I think they said, we have a great product here. It can do a lot. People who are, who are recreational users, people that want to do kind of cam do some camping, do some uh, gardening work. They thought it was a great pickup for everybody, but it may not be the case. We'll see. I think price is a big factor too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Pross, I have my eyes on a different story today. Another sad story in terms of how the stock is performing and how sales have been going when you take a look at Rite Aid. Rite Aid declare, or filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy on Sunday night, the stock taking a big dip today. This comes as sales have been falling at Rite Aid and really sort of going below flat over the last couple quarters. And then you also just take a look at they have some debt coming up. They've had that filing for the opioid crisis, multiple, multiple lawsuits coming from that. But really, guys, to me, the takeaway from this story and sort of when you zoom out and think about what it means is just the concept of Rite Aid had sort of branded themselves as your neighborhood pharmacy, right? That was how they wanted you to be thought of. Over the last couple of years, they've actually been cutting back on locations. And really, when you take a look at a map of where Rite Aid was, they were in two large parts of the country. They were in the Northeast where we are, and they were on the West Coast. They tried to be more local and smaller, mm -hmm. but CVS and Walgreens have been able to beat them out by sort of leveraging being everywhere. When you get a prescription at your pharmacy, you want to be able to get it, right? And then you consider the Amazon effect too and how that's impacted the pharmacy and it just feels hard to be in that midsize right now. Yeah, I think about Rite Aid. There's not many stores that I can think of off of the top of my head and that's a problem, especially if you move. If you're on vacation, you want a store that's convenient to go and get your prescriptions. And you mentioned the Amazon effect. I mean, Express Scripts, there's all these companies mm. now that will deliver your prescription directly to your home. And, and that's just way more convenient to the consumer. That's what they're looking for, convenience at the end of the day. So it feels like this is the start of a lot of those, you know, friendly neighborhood pharmacy chains ultimately going out of business. Yeah, you mentioned the Amazon effect, the Walmartization of that uh, pharmacy business. It's mm -hmm. sort of something that, that I don't know if you've written about this before, but like that PBM pharmacy benefit manager business, like 
basically that's a huge lucrative uh, uh, revenue stream, and you revenue stream I should say, and you want to be kind of have mass. You want to have scale to really kind of amplify those effects. Like I said, Wal I'm sorry, Walgreens, um, CVS, they got scale, they got size. That sort of can make that sort of that that, that business work better than let's say writing on a smaller uh, local regional level. You can't really do that. I and mean, some of these PBM businesses, some of them are bigger than than big pharma. Like mm -hmm. it was pure revenue. I mean, it's a massive thing. And then you think about the other side of Rite Aid's business and just the amount of products they were able to sell out of the store at certain points, right? And then what COVID did to that when you had less people coming into the store, you then have to sell more Clorox wipes to them, more yeah. shampoo, more whatever that general product is that you're buying at Rite Aid for that one trip because you know a website probably the three of us have never been on? You've been on RiteAid.com? <laughs> to order something? Yeah. No, you would immediately go to Amazon, right? So they never had that lever either mm. when it comes to their other product offerings. I mean, it's also a place you can get deodorant, right? Yeah. But you're not ordering you're deodorant not going, from Rite Aid. You're not online. going to Rite Aid when you could potentially go to Walmart, for example, to right. get those types and of And grocery products. shop and get right. everything all in one. It's just a better value proposition for you for your time. Yeah, absolutely. So just real quick, does it mean that Rite Aid is going to go away? They're just going to re reorganize, right? Currently, the plan is to reorganize. Yep, yeah, and we'll, they're, so we'll they're going to plan. Or they're going to close about 400 to 500 stores, yeah. and then with plans to hopefully stick around. But we'll see how they come out of Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Yeah, so. and exit some of those less desirable locations mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Uh, well, you guys have heard of Nepo babies, but what about Nepo <laughs> home buyers? That was kind of a hard transition there, but we went with it. So this is a story that piqued my interest. According to a new Redfin study, 38 percent of new home buyers under the age of 30 bought their home using family money, or at least paid for the down payment using family money. And guys, this makes me think of the housing affordability issues that we're seeing across the board. And if you look at interest rates, they're increasingly high, no reprieve there. If you're a first time home buyer, especially around the age of 30, likely you are going to need some help to purchase that first home, especially as more homes are becoming more expensive. Even the starter homes are becoming pricier to afford. And interesting to see that those that are able to get ahead and own a home are having a little bit of help on that front. I'm almost surprised the number's not higher. I'm well, sure it is. I feel like it is if people are being honest, right? Because yeah. I, I was, we, Ali and I were talking about this a little bit off air. If you account for not necessarily just money for a down payment, but perhaps money you've just received from your parents in the 10 years leading up to you buying that house and potentially getting ahead, whether it be student loan payments or some other big purchase like that that makes you able to buy a home earlier than people, of course they're getting some help. Look at how expensive a house is, a 7.5% mortgage. Yeah. This ain't cheap, Ross. Uh, yeah, it ain't cheap. I gotta imagine, like, we saw that chart over time with the Nepo payments, like, give me 40% for the, for the last 50 years, right? I bet <laughs> parents have been helping kids out or younger young adults out with their mm. homes for a long time, for a long time now. Now we're being amplified by the really bad rate environment for, for mortgages and how ex the crunch for houses. Do. So that's like a double whammy that's making it much harder for right. anyone Supplies, to afford a home. So please. maybe it's going out to the percent, percentage of people that need down payment help. I mean, but I feel like this has always been the case for, for some time now. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And like to your point, if you're getting help paying down your debt in any sort of capacity, mm -hmm. you're getting ahead. And that is leading to a bigger wealth gap at the end of the mm -hmm. day. And, and sort of you can see how cycles like this repeat. If, if you're not able to afford your first home, or if you're not able to have help from your parents, you are going to be set behind a bit comparatively. So I think it's just something to keep the, in mind. The, the, the Nepo, the axios the Nepo. use of uh, Nepo is just too funny. I mean, it really kind of hooked us into it. But really, it's just a tale of that's been the beginning. Since the beginning of time, parents helping their kids out. The question is now, you really need that help. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, that's going to do it for us over here on this side today. Maybe we'll have to see if we can get some loans. Yeah. <laughs> Go buy hey, some mom house. and dad, <laughs> can you help me with my down payment? <laughs> but Am I on the other side, we're going to have more <laughs> Yahoo Finance Live coming at you next.
This year is expected to be the busiest holiday travel season in at least four years. According to our new bank rate survey, 77% of holiday travelers are likely to change their plans thanks to rising prices. Our next guest has some tips and tricks to help us save on travel this holiday season. We have Haley Berg, Hopper's lead economist. So Haley, let's say I'm, tra I'm planning a trip, Haley, for the wife, the kid, the dog. I'm thinking Thanksgiving or the holidays. When do I need to book this trip, Haley? Is this something I need to get on you know, ASAP? You need to book that trip right now. We've reached the end of what we call the sweet spot for the lowest prices for holiday travel. And from here on out, prices are gonna start ticking up as flights sell out. So now is the time to book for both Thanksgiving and Christmas. That's key. We often forget to book our Christmas flights until much too late. Book both holidays now, otherwise you're gonna start missing out on deals and availability. Um, and Haley, hey, it's Julie here. Is that typical like do we tend to see the same seasonal patterns every year or is this year different this year is pretty similar to what we've seen historically pre-pandemic we would typically tell travelers to book by halloween the end of the month in the last couple of years that's moved about two weeks earlier so middle of october is when prices really start to creep up but on the whole, this year, prices are actually lower for domestic travel, which is great for consumers. So even if you're booking a little bit later this year than you did last year, you're going to be getting a lower price. And Haley, what are the best days to travel? Let's say you want to travel around Thanksgiving or around the holidays. What are the best days? Do you want to travel you know, the day before Thanksgiving? Do you want to travel on Christmas Eve? You want to travel on the days that no one else wants to travel. And that does mean that traveling on Christmas Eve, traveling on Thanksgiving Day, it will save you. But that's not your only option. Fly the Monday before Thanksgiving and return the Monday after Thanksgiving, for example. You'll save about 20% flying on Monday instead of one of the peak dates. And skipping that Sunday return saves you about 40%, a couple hundred dollars off of airfare. Same for Christmas. Skip the flying out on Friday, coming back on the 26th. Try to fly earlier in the week before Christmas or on Christmas Eve. Come back on the 28th. That's the sweet spot between people headed home from Christmas and people headed out for New Year's Eve. So if you can be flexible, you'll save hundreds if you can fly on those less expensive days. Um, and Haley, um, is, I think overall people want to know if fares are coming down, right? We've seen such demand in general that fares have been high. Are we seeing any kind of change for that? Absolutely. Prices are lower this year than last year for the holiday season, about 270 per ticket for Thanksgiving, about 400 per ticket for Christmas today. Those are lower, about 12 to 14 percent lower than last year. But on the whole, domestic travel for most of this year has been cheaper than previous years, where we're still feeling the burn of high prices as international trips. We you know, say many people say they knew someone in Europe this summer. International travel has been back really strong, but prices remain incredibly high. The good news is those prices are coming down as well. They haven't yet crossed the threshold into lower than pre-pandemic levels, but we've seen tremendous improvement and 2024 should be much more affordable for those international trips. And Haley, what are the most booked destinations right now for the holidays, domestic and international? Where are people headed? I'm asking so I know where to avoid, obviously. <laughs> No surprise, the biggest destinations in the U.S. are big cities like New York and Orlando. Orlando is very popular for those Disney trips. And internationally, we're seeing London, Tokyo, and Paris. No surprise there as well. Those are pretty popular international destinations that get a lot of love around the time of year when people have a little bit of extra time off work and school. Thank you, Haley Berg from Hopper's, Hopper's Lead Economist there. Thank you, Haley. Great to be with you. And coming up, it is closing time here on Yahoo Finance. We recap top stories of the day and get you set for everything you need to know tomorrow. Stay tuned.
More blockbuster testimony in the fraud trial of Sam Bankman Freed, this time from FTX's former director of engineering. Alexis Keene is back from the courthouse with the very latest. Alexis. Hey there. Yes, so pretty explosive testimony today, and it came from, as you said, the head engineer for FTX and a former high school classmate of Bankman Freed's, Nishad Singh. Now, he's one of three top executives at FTX that have already pleaded guilty to multiple criminal charges and have agreed to cooperate with the prosecution's case. Now, Singh described Sam Bankman Freed as, quote, the architect of the computer systems that allowed its hedge fund, sister hedge fund, Alameda Research, access to FTX funds, though he did say that uh, FTX was not coded by Sam, Sam Bankman fried that the, the computer coding, that was done by others. Now, uh, he said that he really had the same experience as what we heard from some of the other insider witnesses. He corroborated their story, saying that it was as of June 2022, that it was that time that he knew that Alameda was using customer funds in order to go ahead and perform its trading, pay his expenses, and other uh, things that Alameda had in their, under its roof. Um, he said that Alameda at that time was owing FTX $13 billion, and he said he asked Bankman Freed about how much money it had at that time to pay customers back, to pay into that fund for FTX. And at that time, he said that Bankman Freed said that there was just $5 billion against that $13 billion in deliverables or liquid assets in order to put money back into those accounts. Now, his big revelation was that after all of this, he said he called for two separate private conversations with Bankman Freed. And one of those took place on the balcony at this $35 million luxury condominium that he shared as a place to live with Bankman Freed and some of the other executives. And he said at that time, he asked Bankman Freed, quote, what the hell the plan was for this company to make good to its customers. And he said at that time, Bankman Freed said he was going to try to go and raise money, which he did. He flew to the Mideast. He tried to raise money from uh, the Saudi prince, Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, that didn't work out so well, as we've come to learn. Uh, but he also said that all while knowing this, that FTX, that Al through Alameda, continued to make political donations to various candidates and causes, and also to continue to make investments uh, that included to Anthony Scaramucci's Skybridge Capital, uh, among others. But the, the point here that the prosecution was trying to make is that all while this was going on, that that customers were owed money, uh, that they continued to make these excessive, is what he called them, expenditures. This trial just continues to be fascinating. Thanks so much for giving us this update, Alexis. Well, it's closing time here at Yahoo Finance. Here's a look at some of the top stories of the day. The economic cost of the United Auto Workers strike is rising. The Anderson Economic Group saying the walkouts have caused a $7.7 billion hit to the economy. The strike is now entering its fifth week and tensions are higher than ever. Ford Executive Chairman Bill Ford speaking out and calling for an end to the strike, saying it threatens the future of the company and the auto industry overall in the U.S. Microsoft's LinkedIn making a second round of job cuts this year. The company laying off nearly 700 workers amid slowing revenue growth. And all state shares jumping just ahead of the closing bell on Wall Street. Reuters reporting that the insurer is Nelson Peltz's latest target. The report says that he's built a stake in the company, but it's unclear how large that stake is. All state has struggled in the aftermath of natural disasters. It has reported five straight quarters of losses. And here's what to watch tomorrow. It's a big day for financial earnings as Bank of America and Goldman Sachs report ahead of the opening bell. Already we've seen higher interest rates help lift profits for JP Morgan and Wells Fargo. Despite that, CEOs are still warning of headwinds in the next quarter triggered by the war in the Middle East. We'll also be hearing from Dow component Johnson & Johnson ahead of the open, the first report after its spinoff of its consumer health business. And after the close, United Airlines will also be reporting, and we're going to break down those numbers right here on the program. On the economic front, we'll be getting the September retail sales report, which is expected to show slight growth. We'll also hear from three Fed officials, Michelle Bowman, Tom Barkin, and Neil Kashkari, all set to speak. 
And on Capitol Hill, we're expecting to get a vote on Congressman Jim Jordan's nomination to be House Speaker. Jordan is still working to secure those 217 votes needed to get the job, but he's made progress rolling out several key endorsements ahead of the vote. Well, that'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow, 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern. We will take you up to and through the closing bell. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you.